So let's talk about the industry. Here we are. It's 2024 at an amazing boat show, and there's boats from all over the world. This show is probably turning into being one of the destination shows. I, I think it's really earning its stripes as no far as being a place to be. In a, you're in a small fraternity right now, it, it, just a couple U.S. boat builders, and I'm going to speak with most of them this week. What's our future look like? And as a boat builder, talk to me about your vision, Daryl, about where we can go and what needs to happen maybe to to get where we ought to be. Is, is that a fair question? Is that a good... Yeah, it's, and there's a lot of factors to it. Our The competition is high in our size range. 50-meter boat isn't that big a boat anymore. It wasn't too long ago. A 100-foot boat seemed like, oh my gosh, how could, what, what would you need more than this? Right. And it, that just flew by. And anyway, but foreign competition is always a challenge in that they don't necessarily have, and not all of them, but they don't necessarily have the restrictions that we have, emission restrictions. We've had to, in all the years that we built, we used what was called an impregnator, which is a like an overhead crane, but it, it all, all the resin and catalyst and everything is pumped up into that machine, and it takes the fabric and saturates it, rolls it out, and then feeds it down into the boat, and that right. goes up and down the building. And but there's you've got the odor of the styrene it and that yeah so you, we can do all kinds of ventilation but they the, requires permits the permits are expensive and they're difficult to increase if you want to grow so one of the solutions is change and go to all infusion infusion is considered closed mold and and so we've done all decks and soles and bulkheads and stringers and all that kind of stuff in infusion for years many years long as i've been there but not so much the hull and part of that is we build a hull and we put so much content in it what you can see in infusion is is the inside laminate what you can't see is the outside while it's still sitting in the mold well, during that process, we put tanks in, we put sometimes engines, certainly all the engine stringers, bulkheads. Yep. So we, we take the content of the entire cruise quarter on, on this boat would be in, so would the lower deck guest accommodation, before we pull the hole out of the mold. Well, if there's a problem, and you have to, it, and it could be bad enough, you have to abandon the hull, you've got too much content in it. Uh. So you, so anyway, we as long as we could, we've been avoiding infusing the hulls. The one or the one seventeen is a fully infused. Every inch of that boat's infused. Right. And but the tooling has to be made a little bit different. There's a lot of other disciplines that you employ at that point. But there's great. There's no odor in the shop, and there's no emissions going out. And so it really there is great benefit. Right. Not only just to the comfort in the shop, but also the fact that we're not putting it up in the atmosphere. But again, it takes, that's extra cost. Our competition doesn't have to do. And I, uh, <clears throat> at a risk of being politically incorrect, you're building in Washington state. So coming from Florida, you, you, for instance, I know, for instance, during the COVID crisis that you guys were really burdened and restricted what you could do in that. I also recognize that you're not a state that is, currently very pro-business so that doesn't help you cost much either is it? i think we're f like 47 worst state to do business in <laughs> not particularly and... appealing <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah that's unfortunate because there's such a maritime heritage out there right and to let that go away because of bureaucracy is unfortunate yes i would agree bring this into the conversation i was talking to bert files uh, a little over a week ago and he was talking about a frictionless owner's experience. I'm in the process of setting up a business myself right now where we're going to be bringing what I would describe as a concierge level ownership experience and management and such. And looking at it from the perspective of ship design and boat building, is there thought mindset that goes into future designs that either work towards that mindset of frictionless owner's experience or 
enhanced crew experience, which I think then dovetails back to the owner's experience. You have a happy crew, you end up with a happy owner. you have any thoughts to share as far as what that could look like or what you may be considering to um, do to support your owners? Well, we certainly recognize that crew is a big challenge, and part of it, and nothing against what's happened, but with this shared or fractional crew, that took a huge portion of the pool. So a boat like this would maybe have 12 crew normally, including captain. Yep. But now they may have 24. They could, yeah. Because of the... More and more going on rotation. Right. Yep. And, and it, it isn't necessarily that drastic, but it's close. Right. And uh, so you diluted the pool tremendously. So the need, right. it's there. Right. And if you're a Jones Act boat, American flag... The pool's even smaller, shallower. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, so that's a hurdle that every boat is going to struggle with. It's, And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's still a factor that has to be dealt with. Yeah. And uh, so we have our business model on what we do is we design the boat, and very rarely do we change anything on the boat. And when I say that, interior-wise, it, it, it's a blank sheet of paper if somebody wants to go that way. But... From the mechanical side, we try not to deviate from our standard because these things go all over the world, right. and they're going to want support. They're, they're, things are going to break. It's yeah. just, and so we want to be able to service them. We want to be able to have most of the pieces and parts in stock, and that's a huge problem today with the supply chain being as, as oh, challenged as it is. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And Am so, I allowed to brag a little bit about your support? Well, sure. <laughs> what I mean by that is, I, I going back to when we first, well, not when we first started doing business. We'd been doing business for a while, and I had flown out to Port Angeles to look at probably one of these boats. And you pulled me aside and say, Rick, you have a problem with a client that has a Nordland that's down somewhere in the south of where we were. I don't think it was all the way south to, to Port, Port, or rather Westport, but... You put me on one of your airplanes, or your airplane, and you flew me down to meet with that customer that day, and then flew me back up, and you did that. <laughs> I was blown away by that, and it, it was because you felt it was important that we step up to to the plate and take care of this customer, which we we're, of course, willing to do, but the fact that you were willing to facilitate that, and it wasn't one of your boats, it was one of your competitor's boats, but it was a client that I think you had a lot of love and respect for. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always remembered that. And when I talk to people about <laughs> Daryl Wakefield, the, the thing that comes back all the time is, oh, he's one of the good guys. And I'll tell you, you are, because <laughs> you have had a career where you've stepped up. And I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but I, that's my privilege now. You do well for others. And, and it's also something to talk about in this industry is when you do well for others, it comes back to you. And Absolutely. I think you're, you live that, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with people listening to this podcast. <laughs> Your future. Talk to me. What's things look like? Well, we're, we're, I think we've slowed down a lot over the last few years. COVID really whacked us. COVID, uh, of course, you mentioned it earlier about Washington State. We were basically just mandated to shut the doors, send everybody home. Brutal. And we had no idea if it was a week, a month, or a year. And, uh, and they couldn't tell us. All they said is, you're not you're a non-essential business shut your doors we had launched four boats in the previous weeks of that and uh, we were able to lobby hard to allow us to put crew on those boats two of them were sold two of them were on, built on spec but we, you can't leave them no and uh, so anyway we were we did get the green light on that and that helped but it was only a dozen people between the four boats and but so we were shut for two months before they started to loosen the the noose a little bit and let us get back unfortunately not all industries out that direction were were non-essential and they were able to continue to work so they plucked a lot of the good people of for sure and and it really made it difficult when the lights could go back on, which were, like I say, were a couple of months and, and a few weeks later. We had a heck of a time getting people back. 
and we've, we've got them, but we've got, but, but we're operating skilled industry. You don't just take yeah. someone off the street. Oh, no, we, we go got, through we years got and years in the skill yeah. side. Yeah. <laughs> and, and not that the people that came on board weren't interested in trying hard, but they weren't trained. They weren't at that skills level that they could be left alone. Right. And so it, it was a battle. And so we went. At the time when we shut our doors from about oh, well, was pretty close to 550 people, and uh, that we sent home, and uh, between three factories, but yeah, nonetheless, was it was it was real, and uh, and then when the lights did come back on, we struggled to get to 100, and uh, now we're today we're up just over 200, and uh, but that's still not it won't support what we want to be doing. Right, right, and uh, so that's the next phase is to continue to build the crew and continue to grow and uh, get back. We had a good year last year. We delivered a 112 and two 125s, and which actually the 125 has been stretched now to 135, and that's to accommodate the uh, exhaust after treatment, or the SCRs as they call yeah. it. So our first one is out there now and living down here. It's in Miami right now. Good. And so not a lot of time on it yet. It was quite a challenge to meet everything that's required because this big, massive filter sits right over the top of the engine. It's the same size as the engine. Imagine that. And and it's then it's also exhaust temperature, so it's hot. So ventilation in the engine room goes to double what it used to be. And there's just a lot of things. A lot of equipment has to be moved, out, an of, moved out of there to right. just to make room. Right. And so it was a complete redesign of the mechanical systems on the boat. Right. Not didn't change the system so much, but located in a different place. So let me ask you this question. Um, I see a lot of design moving towards diesel electric. Mm -hmm. Is that something that would potentially be in your future? Could we, you go we, there? We have, we've been working with a company to work us through the process. We're not there yet, and but it's definitely something that's going to have to be considered. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too deeply. There's there's so many sides of this topic that you could fall into in, in a full electric boat. I don't know when that would make sense, but there are other propulsion technologies, other fuel types that are mm -hmm. being considered. I know in the larger boats where you probably can fit more bunker, more fuel space, right? methanol and hydrogen becomes in the conversation. But it, I've looked at some projects recently that have gone diesel electric, and there seems to be some advantages. It, it's, I guess, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and and we definitely have our eye on on that, and we're just not quite ready. Well, well, you, until you've got it fully worked out, you nobody's ready. It's it's <laughs> and, and again, going back to what we're talking about boat building being a low margin business, you've got to be able to scale that. You know, it doesn't make sense to bring in a lot of new technologies that your clients, your potential buyers may or may not want, um, unless there's a clear direction that's going to open up a market or it's going to bring in X number of sales type of thing. So it makes perfect sense. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I really thank you for sitting with me, Daryl. I also have to thank you for sponsoring our podcast. That's, uh, that's, that speaks volumes of the success we're enjoying right now as we're talking to shipyards and people in this industry. We're happy to share the Westport logo and, and tell people that you guys are the good guys. You build great boats. <laughs> you stand behind the boats you build. You've got a wonderful legacy. You've been a wonderful friend in this industry, and I look forward to our next decade plus working together at some level. And um, I hope you have a great week this week. Well, thank you. Yeah, we couldn't. It couldn't be more perfect than it is right now. I'll I tell, tell you, you what, so. we got a bluebird sky day and a great start to what should be a wonderful Palm Beach boat show. So this is Rick Thomas, host of Yachting USA. I'm produced by Rhea with Yachting International Radio, sitting with Daryl Wakefield, president <laughs> of Westport Shipyards. That's a mouthful. I thank everybody for listening in, and until the next time, we're out of here. <laughs>